this is Cancer Week in Ireland, <clears throat> and I think it's really, really important that Trinity College, in association with the Irish Cancer Society, have taken the initiative. The World Health Organization has estimated that one in three of us will die from cancer, one in three of us will get cancer during our lifetimes, and one in three of us will live with somebody with cancer. So effectively everybody is touched by cancer, and we know this from our own personal life stories and our own personal family stories. So the Cancer Week, uh, in terms of Ireland, puts into the consciousness of the general public the importance of cancer prevention, cancer screening, cancer treatment. And the message is about hope. It's all about people being aware, people going early if they think they've got, it, if they've got cancer, and getting treatment early. I think in the last f five to ten years, the biggest advance in cancer survivorship and cancer therapeutics has been the whole area of what we call cancer theranostics which is therapeutics linked to diagnostics. And this is essentially the realm of cancer personalized medicine. So the, the best estimates we have for cancer burden right now are that in 2012, there are about 14 million new cases of cancer occurring across the world and about 8 million uh, deaths from cancer globally. But the really striking thing is the, the projected changes in those figures, so that in just 20 years' time, we're anticipating around uh, 22 million new cases of cancer worldwide, so about a 50% increase in just 20 years. But I think what's very exciting in recent years is the, the real advance in understanding the underlying development of cancer. At a, at a cellular and molecular level. That understanding is giving us new tools to try to say, well, what is it that's caused that cancer to develop? And that in a sense, there's a fingerprint of the exposure that, that led to that cancer is left in the tumor. And this might give us new clues to the causes of the disease. Cancer survivorship is really important today, and it's important because so many more people are surviving their cancer. But over time, they can, as I say, suffer both physical and emotional side effects of their treatment. And really, the aim of the Cancer Society, one of our strategic goals, is to improve the lives of those living with cancer. And if you can get people to deal with the physical and emotional side effects and really return to normality, get back to you know work, uh, being with our families, living as normal a life as possible and with the best quality of life. Um, that's really what we want to do. We, we want, as much as we can, happy, healthy cancer survivors. So survivorship today for children and young adolescents with cancer is really as high as it's ever been in the last 20, 25 years. We're now up to around 80 to 85 percent of all cancers. So that's really about 20, 25 percent ahead of our adult partners, adult cancers. And even within that group, if you drill down into the younger children, children under, say, um, 10 years of age, especially with the acute leukemias, the overall um, survival rates are exceeding 90% now. So it's quite fantastic. And the reasons for that are many fold, but I suppose the most important thing is to actually risk stratify those children. In other words, those children who don't need a lot of treatment get less treatment and they're still cured, whereas the children who need a lot more treatment because they've got resistant disease get more treatment and they're cured as well. So we're getting more and more of our children and adolescents going into survivorship programs and it's fantastic to see these children growing up to have normal fertility, to have their own children, etc, etc. So it's, it's a fantastic story. What we're going to be doing in the next five to ten years is we're going to actually be individualizing cancer treatments. So up to now we've been really doing it on a cohort basis, on a population basis, where we give the population of, say, children with acute leukemia all the same treatment. The last big clinical trial we performed, which incorporated over 3,000 children, what we did was we looked at the molecular biology of their response. So we could take out the good actors versus the bad actors and appropriately treat those. Going forward over the next five to 10 years, we won't be giving blunderbuss chemotherapy to everybody. We'll be picking out some of those children, giving them targeted molecular 
um, drugs to, to inhibit the cancer program. So we'll get less toxicity in the long run. And in fact, this has already happened in one particular form of leukemia called acute promyelocytic leukemia. This cancer was probably the most malignant cancer in the 1970s and now it's the most curable cancer. And it's because we're using these drugs in a site-specific way. Well, the main advance in, in surgery is that it's a safer patient, patient journey, uh, by and large, because the concentration that we see with our own National Cancer Control Pro Program of complex cancers has only been done by expert surgeons in, in appropriate institutions. That's really what that's what's happening and that's what increasingly needs to be done and that results in teams of, of people. It's just not about the surgery but it's about the team, it's about the institution, it's about the virtuous uh, circle of knowledge and experience with a cancer. So the safer patient journey for the most difficult of cancers is, 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 is something that's very significant. Surgery when it's done for cancer now is done having only the most sophisticated technology used for for staging or diagnosis of the cancer with the advances in MRI scans and PET scans and the like. So a surgery done, done much more appro appropriately with the intention of cure rather than in, in a kind of a, a less structured way that it might have been done maybe 10, 15 years ago and certainly prior, prior to that. Uh, thirdly, uh, great advances in keyhole surgery. So a lot of cancer surgery can be done through what's called minimally invasive, sometimes laparoscopic surgery that, uh, that makes it usually a more, a, a more uh, trouble-free, uh, less stressful uh, journey for the patient with quicker recovery, hopefully less pain, and equivalent, hopefully, cancer results, at least to the more traditional open operations. And the other big advance, and I'd like to think that, that, that we're playing a good role at in Trinity, is that surgeons are increasingly becoming very connected with the the research and the scientific teams and working together very, very closely to try and as part of a team to advance the research. I think that's a big advance and we're seeing that not only in Ireland but internationally and that's a very, very important role for any surgeon who deals with cancer, that they're not just separate from all of that but they become connected with it. The area of circulating tumour cells or CTCs is tremendously um, popular among research centres at the moment. And this is because um, using techniques which allow us to detect circulating tumour cells, we as scientists and then as physicians are able to better detect and more appropriately triage patients for the appropriate treatment. One area that is gaining quite a lot of interest is this notion that when it's a tumour cell leaves the tumour and enters the patient's bloodstream, it has to do a number of things. First of all, its objective is to get to a distant site so that it can set up a new colony of cells. And that would equate to the disease progressing in that patient. But in order to do that from the tumour cell's perspective, it has a lot of obstacles it needs to overcome. And one way it does that is in order to try and evade the patient's own immune system very sneakily, it hides itself among platelets. And these are little cells that are in our blood and that we need, and they are normal cells. So when the tumour cell has cloaked itself with platelets, the immune system is less likely to be able to detect it and eradicate it. And that is one way that we've begun to understand the mechanism through which metastasis or cancer spread occurs. We're working closely in Trinity College with colleagues in Dublin City University. And in that regard at Trinity, we're providing the biology insight and our colleagues at Dublin City University are providing bioengineering. And in that way, we're trying to merge our resources so that we will be able to develop a new device which will be able to monitor these cells in patient samples. And the advantage there is that individual patients, as their tumour progresses, we will see increased numbers of these cells trafficking through the blood. And equally for patients who are receiving treatment, a decreasing number in the blood sample will reflect that the treatment is working. And so we're able to transform how we can treat patients based on this very minimally invasive test, which is quite different from the current situation where actual biopsies of tissue have to be taken. I think one of the most exciting developments in recent years in breast cancer is the move towards more targeted or personalised therapies for breast cancer. 
Traditional chemotherapy isn't smart. It treats any cells that are turning over quickly and therefore is associated with a lot of side effects, hair loss, diarrhea, nausea that patients would be familiar with. These days we're trying to look at the specific DNA abnormalities or mutations within the DNA genetic code of cancer cells. This makes them very unique and new drugs have been developed that target just those unique abnormalities and have the potential to treat the cancer without affecting normal healthy cells and therefore potentially to avoid the side effects associated with traditional treatments. It's great to come together and network. For example, I've been abroad for the last seven years. I haven't been within the Irish research community. I'm eager to come back and start to work to bring research ideas forward here. And to do that, you need collaborators. You need to know your scientists in the lab, your colleagues in universities across town so that you can work together. I have access to the patients. I'll bring with me my skill and my connections from the States, but I need those grassroots connection here so we can move forward things for Irish patients also. So conferences like this are the springboard for us to make those connections and come up with the plans together that will be the foundation for our research for the next five to 10 years. The National Conference for Cancer Survivorship is about supporting people who have had a cancer diagnosis uh, through that process. Uh, there's about 160,000 cancer survivors in Ireland and numbers are increasing every year as treatments improve and people live longer. But the conference is really aimed at helping people deal with both the physical and the emotional side effects of having a cancer diagnosis. And it's also open to those who care for them, those close to them, family members. I think when we think about prevention, we have to think on two levels, really. One is what the individual can do and actions that the individual can take to reduce their cancer risk. And there are a number of uh, aspects to that. But I think increasingly we're recognizing that that needs to be matched by policy interventions at the national or regional or even global level. Uh, and examples certainly related to things like air pollution levels, which are beyond the control of the individual, but also things like uh, alcohol or tobacco consumption or the, the consumption of very calorie rich foods which whilst partially under the control of the individual are heavily influenced as well by, by marketing. And I think this is where the government can also look at policies that might uh, change the consumption patterns of some of those known cancer risk factors. And finding that balance between individual responsibility and the actions at the, at the government level, I think is one of the great debates that we need to have in relation to cancer control in the coming years. Trinity College, in terms of Ireland, is probably one of the premier institutions in the area of cancer research. We divide our cancer work into, I suppose, two broad areas. One is anatomically based, based on the organ from which the cancer comes from. And secondly, is mechanistically based, based on the gene pathways that have disrupted. And right now, we have several major cancer systems and we are major international players in certain cancer areas, such as esophagus, thyroid, melanoma, uh, cervix, ovary, prostate, lung, to mention just a few. Um, this was also very exciting. We have a very, very good um, pharmacy uh, and drug discovery program here in Trinity College, which essentially you know, adds value to the, to the pipeline in terms of taking you know, the disease in the patient, uh, looking at the disease, formulating new therapies, and then giving that new therapeutic to that particular patient. So we are in a very, very good position uh, in terms of to be able to offer, I suppose, the, the entire solution for Irish patients and for patients internationally.